Hello, I'm Fred Knapp with NET News. Across the nation and here in Nebraska, the intersection of police and people with mental health issues affects us all. It impacts public safety and public budgets, and it says a lot about how we treat each other. I'm here with four people who know a lot about this situation. Sergeant John Walsh is with the Lincoln Police Department. Ashley Wilkson is a peer support specialist helping people avoid encounters with police. Mel McNay is CEO of Great Plains Health in North Platte. And Senator Kate Bowles chairs the legislature's behavioral and mental health task force. Thank you all for being here. For the next half hour, we'll talk about these issues. This is Nebraska's mental health, who's responding? Let's start by taking a look at just how many calls to police are about mental health situations. In the first half of this year, Lincoln Police got about 500 calls about violent crimes, but three times that many that led to mental health investigations. Sergeant Walsh, what is a typical call that you get and uh, how do you respond to it? Well, a typical star call usually starts when we get a call from a concerned family member or a friend of an individual who maybe is having a rough time or they know suffering from some sort of mental health issue or substance dependence. Um, we'll get a call to go out there and check their welfare, um, see how they're doing. We have some questions we'll ask them, see where they're at. Um, it's our job if we determine that they're a danger to themselves or others that we can place them into emergency protective custody for their safety. Um, many of those don't reach that level. The great majority, in fact, don't. We've already spawned, responded to 2,500 calls for service that are labeled as a mental health call for service. Um, we've only placed 262 individuals, some, some of those being repetitive, into emergency protective custody. So again, the great majority isn't like that. Um, we have several options at that point. We can refer them to services, but the one we most commonly use is we make a referral to the Lincoln Police Department um, Mental Health Association Real Referral Program. And what does real stand for? It's respond, empower, advocate, and listen. Okay. And uh, how that works is the officer sends an email to one of the peers at MHA and gives them a little bit of an idea of what's going on with the individual, where they live at, how they can get a hold of them. And the peer's job is to go out and try to make contact within 24 hours to see how they're doing, to check up on them, see if there's anything they can do to help them out. Before, we'd hand them a business card and hope they could remember the next day. Or, But this is a living, breathing business card that shows up at their door and says, hey, what can we do to help you? And Ashley, those are folks that you work with. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what, where do you pick it up from when you get a referral like that? Well, once the police department sends a referral to us, um, like he said, we try and make contact within 24 hours. Um, and that could be anything. We usually um, start with a phone call just because it can be kind of intimidating if somebody just shows up on your doorstep. Um, but we try and make contact with them with the, you know, go, calling them. And then if that doesn't work or if they want us to come out in person, um, we can go out to their, their residence. Um, what we also, I mean, sometimes our referrals are people that are homeless or couch surfing or we've gone and looked under bridges. We've gone and, I mean, the officer says, I'm sorry, I don't have an address, but I see him regularly on this corner and we'll go and we'll hang out and we'll see if we can make contact with them to try and hook him up with some services. So that's an example of something that's going on in, in Lincoln. Mel McNay, as CEO of the hospital in North Platte, what's your experience with people who have had uh, mental health issues and contact with law enforcement? Um, in the North Platte vicinity, and we also cover a wide geographical area, about a 17-county area for behavioral health, we are one of only two behavioral health inpatient units in western Nebraska. Typically, when we encounter a patient, um, our police use something similar to the real program. It's called QPR, which is question, persuade, and refer. And um, if they're successful or if they feel the issue is uh, something that needs to be escalated and needs medical attention and some of the resources of our psychiatrists, they'll bring those patients to our emergency room or um, use some of our outpatient programs. So our patients are referred in those two ways. Um, if they are in our emergency room, they go through an evaluation with our emergency room physicians and our psychiatrists. And if it's um, something that we feel there's risk to their life or that there's treatment that needs to occur, they're referred to the inpatient unit for treatment. Okay. Senator Bowles, there's a huge disparity around the state in terms of population and, and resources. Are there some overarching themes that you uh, see in terms of what's needed to help the situation? 
Sure. As chair of the Mental and Behavioral Health Task Force, we heard from um, stakeholders ranging from physicians to individuals and family members to folks who run service programs. And some of the themes that we heard across the board were um, challenges with access. Uh, the right service at the right time for the right person isn't always available. And wait times can be, on average, three weeks. Um, so that can be a significant challenge for someone who's experiencing um, challenges with a, a substance use or an other mental uh, illness or challenge. Other themes included ability to pay. A significant number of people who uh, might have a mental illness or a substance abuse challenge don't necessarily have access to insurance. Um, two other cross-cutting themes are uh, workforce. We have a lack of workforce uh, ranging from licensed mental health therapists to psychologists and psychiatrists, prescribers, which is one of the reasons that folks like Ashley are so valuable. The last piece is on the back end. Um, there's not always a safe, stable place for someone to go once they have completed treatment. So that supportive housing um, ab availability is a, is a challenge in almost every place in the state. And Mel, um, we've talked about uh, the uh, high degree of admissions to your hospital that are either psychoses or related to alcohol or drugs. What, what's the overlap between those problems and, and mental health? Usually with the mental health patient, um, when they enter our facility, there is issues relative to drug and alcohol abuse to related to um, their behavioral health issues. Um, our number one um, patient population that we treat is actually psychosis. The number three in our institution is drug and alcohol related. So they tie closely together. Um, it creates a, a, a patient population that can sometimes end up on our medical units um, because they need treatment for the medical um, portion of the abuse of drug and alcohol before they can get treatment for their psychosis. So if you look at the overall costs associated with those patients, just their inpatient stay in a behavioral health unit really doesn't include all the expenses or the expense that occurs through long-term treatment because you have those issues relative to drug and alcohol medically too. And I imagine that for folks without insurance, those costs get passed along to the rest of your patients and to people with insurance. They do. And um, in western Nebraska, um, for those patients that have that drug and alcohol tied to their psychosis or behavioral health issues, there isn't um, long-term treatment uh, for those individuals' recovery programs. And so what we witness or see is just a recurring theme of patients coming through our emergency room being treated for um, their, their behavioral health issues, um, trying to help them with their drug and alcohol, but it's just a revolving pattern where they visit our ER, so it's an ongoing expense with really no treatment. And Senator Bowles, your special committee uh, had some pretty surprising statistics about the availability of treatment. What did you find? The University of Nebraska Medical Center was contracted by our behavioral health division to do a statewide gaps and needs analysis. And for me, the most striking numbers were related to substance use treatment. Only 7% of individuals who experience a need for alcohol-related treatment receive it, and only 11% of those who um, experience a need for substance abuse treatment receive it. So um, the other theme that is related is that we have a binge drinking problem in our state. And so I think the needs aren't matching up with the resources. Mm -hmm. And it's, is it worse here than in other states? It is comparatively worse. Yeah. Uh, Sergeant Walsh, when, when uh, you go out on a call and it, and, uh, it develops that uh, the root of the uh, call uh, is a, a substance abuse or alcohol problem, what options do the police have in dealing with that? Do you, do you have some discretion? We do have some digression, uh, discretion in that. Um, the first is if they're out in, in public and on public ground and they're dangerous to themselves and the alcohol is affecting maybe their safety and nobody's willing or able to take care of them, we can take them to the bridge and place them there. It's a safe place where they can go up until the uh, blood alcohol level drops to a safe level or they become um, safe to be out on their own. Um, the other one is, again, we'll use the peer service. Uh, we'll make a referral on that. Uh, maybe they can go out at some point, maybe when they're not under the influence and catch them and talk to them and see what things that they can offer them. Mm -hmm. and, and Ashley, when you get a referral like that, what, what can you do? What do you do? 
Um, I think the main thing is talking to the person and figuring out what exactly they're wanting. If they are wanting treatment, um, there is a lot of barriers to getting treatment, but I mean, I feel like we've, as peers, a lot of us have been, a lot of my coworkers have been through treatment themselves, so they kind of know how to navigate that system and who to call um, to help somebody get into treatment if that's what they're wanting. And is it less intimidating for the people that you're trying to help? Um, I would assume so because you know I mean as peers we're coming from a place of I've been there I've been through a similar situation um, and and I made it out the other side and I want to walk through this journey with you if that's what you're wanting to do. Okay. Um, Sergeant Walsh can you uh, give me a, a, a concrete example of somebody that that's been helped in this in this way yeah um, unfortunately sometimes people make the news due to their behavior and and we had a party that made the news and it was somebody we'd been aware of for quite some time that had a problem with narcotics and um, we quickly learned that um, what was presenting as mental health symptoms was just uh, caused by the narcotics. So we had to change the way that we were dealing with this individual, taking him to the hospital and putting him into emergency protective custody wasn't the right thing to do. And we had consulted the peers and talked to them about what would be appropriate. And uh, we came to the conclusion that uh, if, if their behavior warrants it, you know, sometimes jail is appropriate. And so this party we stuck with and we spoke with as police officers, as a whole team, three shifts, saying when we had contact with him, updating each other on what was going on. And based on that, everybody went into that call knowing what happened the last time. And so eventually the officers knew good enough when uh, he was kind of, it was right to talk to him about maybe getting in. And um, we were able to go out and make contact with him. Um, he accepted services and was in waiting two weeks maybe to get in. but. Um, didn't feel like he could safely wait and be sober that long. So we hooked him up with the Kia House, which is also run by the Mental Health Association. And with their help, he was able to stay sober and get into that. And now he's uh, drug free, he's got a job, has taken care of all of his illegal commitments and um, is doing well. That's great. And Ashley, I wanna pick up with that story. But first I wanna remind folks, if you're just joining us, this is an NET News special, Nebraska Mental Health, who's responding. I'm Fred Knapp and with me are Lincoln Police Sergeant John Walsh, Ashley Wilkson of the Mental Health Association of Nebraska, Mel McNay of Great Plains Health in North Platte, and State Senator Kate Bowles. This program is also available on our website, netnebraska.org. So, Ashley, picking up on the story that Sergeant Walsh was telling, um, have, have there, has there been follow-up with this, this person that uh, he was describing? I'm trying to remember who you're talking about. Oh, well, let's um, not use but, the name. Well, uh, no, yeah. no, um, but we, we tend to follow up with, with all the people that we're working with, um, especially somebody who we've collaborated as a team with, um, with LPD, and it sounds like we... Yeah, and he mentioned the Kia House. Can you describe mm -hmm. that a little bit? Um, the Kia House is a is a short term respite stay for individuals seeking um, support and services. Um, somebody could come in and stay for up to five nights, and sometimes we bend our rules and go two weeks or so. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, they can come in, and we can provide. 24-7 peer support, um, hook them up with any resources, community resources, or anything that they're needing. And, and you use the term respite. When I think mm -hmm. of respite, I think of respite care for people with sick relatives, but these are for the people themselves that mm -hmm. feel like they're slipping towards the edge, sort of. Yeah, um, a lot of times um, we're wanting to catch people before they're needing hospitalization. We want we want to catch people and be more preventative. Um, so when you know, a lot of times when somebody's referred to the real program, we will let them know that Kia House is available. Um, they could come and they can stay for that five day stay, kind of get away from whatever it is that's going on in their life. But they can still go to work. They can still take care of their kids or their dog or you know whatever it is so it's not um, as possibly intrusive in their lives um, as as maybe like an inpatient hospital stay if that's not necessarily what they're needing now when it comes to inpatient hospital stays you referred to those Mel um, uh, I know that from talking to the sheriff in, in Lincoln County they have some programs for jail inmates but what about the people that don't go through the jail that just come directly to you what are your options when we provide some outpatient services, um, some outpatient programs, 
but because of the geographical size of the area we serve, it's real difficult for those patients to return to those outpatient services. And uh, in and now that's the huge geographical stretch all the way from uh, South Dakota to um, the Kansas border. Right. And so it's real difficult for the patients to keep their appointments. We don't have a good track record of, of success with those type of programs. What we are looking more at is seeing how we can evolve the telehealth program so that we can make available maybe psychiatric services to um, some of the critical access hospitals that serve that patient population around us. But we do not have very much success. Um, we also try to encourage, or our police, um, our law enforcement tries to encourage referral to Region 2. Um, but there is a probably Which is about, the state region that deals with mental health it is. in your area. And our experience there is about a two month wait for those individuals wow. to get an appointment and it's very difficult for them to, for uh, those individuals to keep their appointments because of the geographical size and uh, there's only three counselors that take those appointments. So, wow. mm -hmm. so Senator Bowles, uh, does uh, telehealth hold promise for reducing the kind of waiting times that we're talking about and is it as good as meeting with somebody in person? Mm -hmm. uh, my understanding of, of telehealth is that it does make a difference and sometimes it can even be more effective um, because people really seem to focus on the, the person in front of them um, and, and sometimes it does result in better fidelity um, to keeping appointments, those kinds of things. But I would say that it's only a small piece of the puzzle. We need adequate resources so that folks, say in Region 2, um, can provide services more quickly. Um, and we need to make sure that we're using the full menu of options that are available, starting with prevention and um, ensuring that we have crisis response on the other end. So we've got a lot of work left to do. And, and based on your work with constituents, do you have any individual stories of, of, mm -hmm. of people that have coped with the system and how did they, how did they do? Yeah, I, all, all kinds of stories. Um, but one of my favorites is actually uh, a young man who was experiencing some early onset mental illness who knew that he needed help um, but was denied in a number of different ways. And his family finally came to a state senator and help, with the, our help navigating the system, we were able to get him an earlier diagnosis. What that means for this young man is that he's stabilized and he's now in a community college um, program and he's doing quite well. And the reason that that's one of my favorites is because I think it's a best case scenario. When we can identify someone quickly, um, avoid a crisis and put them on, on the right medication and the right track for their lives, the intersection with hospitals, peers, and, and law enforcement becomes unnecessary. Right. Um, Sergeant Walsh, obviously resources are a constraint in all this, but if you could wave a magic wand and resources were no object, uh, is, are there specific things that you would like to see improved in the system to help people? I think, I think there should be more peers involved. Um, they're not bound by some of the same rules and regulations that a, a licensed mental health practitioner are. They're able to go out and have coffee. They're able to meet people where they're at. Wait, um, so a licensed person can't go out and have coffee? From what I understand, no. But um, yeah. Is that fraternization yeah. or something? Um, and I, I think that would truly help. I mean, they, they all need to work together, and I, I see that as kind of filling in the between the official meetings and between your appointments and um, really kind of filling the gap when somebody needs somebody right now to talk to. Um, the other one would be some sort of, you know, one-stop shop for people that are having problems where they could get connected to a variety of different services, whether it be a peer or whether it be, you know, a counselor that could be there to help them. Somewhere where they could go to be safe for maybe a day. Maybe they don't re reach the level to be placed into emergency protective custody, but still don't feel safe. Right. A place where they could go be safe for that day, have some care, have some people around them to support them, and then, you know, have a little follow through on the backside to where we know they're following up with what they need to and addressing the issues. And, and what kind of success have you had with, uh, for example, the referrals to the real program that we've discussed? Um, you know, we have an officer that sat down and really wanted to study this in depth, and he's done several studies, and some of them have gotten quite deep. Um, the I, one. This is Officer Bonkowitz. Officer Bonkowitz, yes. And, and he, he did talk to me about the six month follow up. Yeah, and on the six month follow up, we're finding out that people that do accept services are half as less likely and ha to be arrested and or be the subject of a mental health investigation. 
Um, he's doing some further research longer term now that um, he's kind of tentatively saying is, is going to show greater, um, greater outcomes three years out. Good. And so that's very positive and looks very good for the program. Ashley, a similar question to you. What, uh, if, if you could wave your magic wand, what, what, what would you uh, improve about the way these problems are treated? Um, you know, obviously I, I agree. I'd like to see uh, more use of certified peer support specialists. Um, you know, throughout different services, it, it could be, it complements traditional services as well. Um, but I guess one thing, for me, it's more focusing on people. Fo focusing, um, looking at people as people and not as a diagnosis. Um, focusing on what their own wants and needs are. Um, not necessarily what we as society or, you know, a, a, a provider expects of them and really focusing on what they want for themselves and then giving them the support and resources to get there. And, and Mel, that's um, uh, more of a challenge perhaps in rural areas, uh, in your service area, than, uh, than in a city. Are there specific ideas that, that you think could help in, in the hinterlands? I also think um, availability to different types of professional individuals that can help the uh, patient or individual having the problems. We're very limited to uh, two general psychiatrists in, in our 17 county area. Um, having adolescent, uh, somebody with some adolescent professional experience would be helpful. I would also say with the patients, you have to look at the entirety of what's going on with them. It isn't just the behavioral health issues, it's really usually a lot of social issues surrounding that. And I think in Nebraska, we tend to not look at a, th these issues as a team. Um, we look at it as different agencies coming in and providing different things. So you need somewhat of a holistic approach and everybody together working on uh, the, the, for the benefit of this patient. Because it's sometimes their environment, their home, their family, um, um, other things that attribute to the issues too. Right. Well, Senator Bowles, uh, there's been a lot of news recently about uh, the projected billion dollar shortfall in the state budget for the next two years, and yet a lot of the ideas that we're talking about here would cost some money. Realistically, what, uh, what can people hope for? What can they expect? I think there are a lot of things to hope for. The first is Nebraska doesn't fully leverage all of the federal funds that we could draw down to address these needs, ranging from amendments to our Medicaid program to Medicaid expansion, which may be less likely under the Trump administration, but those ideas of, of ensuring uh, health insurance coverage for a greater a number of our, our folks who um, have lower incomes can make a huge difference. Other things that are helpful include pretty pragmatic strategies, including the low-cost ones we've talked about today, peer support, respite, now, early intervention. Is, is there a, a, a quality problem, though? I mean, uh, peer support sounds great, and I don't mean at all to diminish what you do, but um, are we, would we be, in effect, relying on people who don't have uh, professional degrees mm -hmm. to do work that should be done by people mm -hmm. with a higher level of training, or, mm -hmm. or is it that there's this gap that really needs to be filled? Mm -hmm. I, th I think we have to look at it comprehensively. Um, some of these strategies help address other gaps in our system. Um, you know, for example, we've talked about the, the behavioral health nursing shortage and the psychiatrist shortage. In the meantime, helping make sure that people get some type of assistance can be in incredibly beneficial. Uh, the legislature passed three years ago something called Mental Health First Aid, which just like C a CPR class teaches people how to early, how to intervene with someone who's struggling. And all of these strategies come together to help all of us become more mentally and behaviorally sound. All right. Well, we just have a few minutes left, but I'd like to ask each of you for some uh, closing thoughts and also to clear up any misconceptions that people might have about this subject. Uh, Sergeant Walsh? You know, I, I think one of the big things that has been a cultural shift for our department has been working with the peers. Um, so many times we get called to people's houses. Um, they don't call us when they're doing well. They call us when something's going on, and we don't always get to see that. We don't get to see what it looks like when that person's doing well. And when we work with peers and they share their stories at some of our trainings, we get to see people who have overcome great odds and, and horrible, horrible things. 
And uh, it really puts a face on mental illness and makes you realize that it's something that could happen to any one of us. It's really no different than having heart disease or glaucoma or any other type of physical ailment. And so lessening some of that stigma, I think, helps us as a department to relate better to people that are, are having these issues, realizing that, you know, it could be any one of us. All right. Ashley Wilkson, uh, closing thoughts, misconceptions to dispel? Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for having me and everybody up here. This has been nice. Um, but I, I totally agree definitely with, with the stigma that surrounds um, mental health and substance use. Um, and working with the, the police department, we've also addressed our own. A lot of my coworkers in their pasts um, haven't always had the greatest relationships with with the Lincoln Police Department or other police departments. So it's it's not only giving them an opportunity to, to see peers um, doing their best and doing really well and being productive members of society with good quality life, um, but we also get to look at a police officer as a person as well and as a father and as you know everything that they are besides just the guy that's trying to arrest us and put him put us in the back good deal <laughs> mel i think as a as a society we have to start looking at behavioral health issues as something that we need to um, come together and resolve um, and work together to help um, better um, the life for these patients in addition, it's so interwoven or um, tied with drug and alcohol that it is a huge expense. And we talk about where the monies or the resources are going to come for the treatment in some of these programs. I think if we can reduce some of the costs associated with them, the hospital stay, the recurring hospital stays, I think um, that might be an opportunity for us to use some of those resources towards this endeavor. Senator Bowles. Two closing thoughts. The, the first is that um, I applaud and appreciate all of the work that's being done across our state, um, and I appreciate the creative solutions. At the same time, I think we need to recognize that our mental and behavioral health public system is under-resourced, and that's part of the root of the problem. Um, the waiting lists and the wait times are illustrative of that. The other point that I'd like to make as a closing thought is the importance of prevention. We really have to rebalance um, not only our systems but our resources to focus more on prevention and less on crisis intervention um, so that we can help our young people grow and develop uh, in a healthy way and in a way that leads to long-term mental, mental well-being. Very good. Well, that's about all the time we have. This has been an NET News special, Nebraska Mental Health who's responding. You can catch this program on the web at netnebraska.org slash news. Thanks again to our guests, Sergeant John Walsh of the Lincoln Police Department, Ashley Wilkson of the Mental Health Association of Nebraska, Great Plains Health CEO Mel McNay, and State Senator Kate Bowles. I'm Fred Knapp of NET News. Thanks for joining us.